The last of the Beatitudes this morning in Matthew chapter 5, if you have your Bible, I want, we're going to read the final three verses because they tie in together. Jesus was preaching the Sermon on the Mount. He was preaching. Thousands of people came around to hear what he had to say. He talked about mercy. He talked about poor of spirit, which is just dying to our flesh. He talked about the peacemakers. We're not peacekeepers, right? We're peacemakers in everything that we do. He talked about those that are hungry, those that are meek. Meek does not mean weak. Amen? And here, he talk, even before he talked about a pure heart, here's what he said in verse number 10. Blessed are those. Listen to me. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my, my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If you believe it, say amen as you're being seated this morning. You may be seated. Thank you for the reverence this morning in the house. Being a Christian is not always popular. You know, we can talk about our society that we live in today. We can talk about the condition of our country. And if you think our country's in good shape, then you, you're right where the devil wants you to be and what he wants you to think. Our country is a mess. Somebody ought to say amen. We used to be able to say as it got worse that we live in a post-Christian society, which means there's not as many Christian people as there used to be. They were still Christian, but it was post-Christian. Now, we live in an anti-Christian society where there are people that will spit in your face because you say you believe in Jesus. There are people that will take your children to the office for singing Jesus Loves Me and demand that they be suspended from school we live in a society where people get angry and they get upset at even the mention of jesus name and they get upset when you try to do the right thing you think about going to school and our young people that we shelter and we pray over them so much can you imagine what they have to go through every day of their life when they enter those public schools those government schools and the persecution that is there. And Jesus made it clear right here, didn't he? He said, you know what? You're going to be persecuted. You, you know, we, we, we have this thing, man, you just serve Jesus. Everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be perfect. Everything in your life's just going to fall into order. Honey, whether you serve Jesus or not, trouble's coming. Amen. He reigns on the just and the unjust. Everyone will feel the wrath of God when it comes against this earth. It doesn't matter what's going on. Good things happen to good people, but sometimes bad things happen to good people. Sometimes things happen that we don't understand. And Jesus, you know, we, 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 y'all, y'all, some of y'all, you serve this little hippie looking Jesus. I know some of y'all love it when I talk about this. You serve your little hippie looking Jesus with long, flippy hair. Man, it looks good on you, right? And that's the way we think Jesus looks, right? He had his, he had his little sandals, his little pale skin, and his little blue eyes. And that hippie looking Jesus would just walk around on this earth. And that's what you serve. But my God was described him in the book of Revelation. He had feet like brass, eyes like fire, a sword in his hand. And he said, hey, who will serve me and who will stand with me? And Jesus was not a sissy. If you're reading the Gospels right now, you're learning that as you read through these two chapters a day. And Jesus made it clear to us, 
about what was going to happen in these last days. He didn't beat around the bush. Tony, he didn't make it sound. He didn't water it down. I want to, let me give you some scripture this morning, what Jesus said, okay? Let me give it to you. Let's, let's start with Luke chapter 9, verse number 58. Here's what Jesus said, right? Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He said, at least a fox has a hole in the ground. At least a bird has a nest. I don't have anywhere to lay my head. Let me tell you something. He was saying persecution is coming. In Luke chapter 21, verse number 12, listen to what he said here. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. He doesn't say you might get persecuted. He said they're going to lay hands on you and you will be persecuted. In Mark chapter 8, verse number 35, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. He said in John chapter 15, verse number 20, listen to this. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. He said persecution is coming. And here's what's happened. We've produced such a sissy generation of Christians that if you get your little feelings hurt and somebody doesn't shake your hand or somebody doesn't let you sing in the choir and get three songs, you get your little feelings hurt and you think that's persecution. Honey, that ain't persecution. You say that preacher got up. And he persecuted me. No, I ain't up here to persecute you. I'm up here to give you hope and to give you love this morning. I'm giving you the words of Jesus. Listen to what he said in Matthew chapter 20. But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. He asked a question. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Then they said to him, we are able. Verse number 23, listen to what he said. He said to them, you indeed will drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and my left hand is not mine to give, but it is for those of whom is prepared for my father. He said, you will be betrayed. You will be scoffed. You will be made fun of. You say, the preacher, this was for the Bible days. This was just for those a uh, long way. No, it's not. And I'll show you that in just a minute when we get there. In the New Testament, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 12, it said it like this. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which, you, which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened to you. Verse number 13, but rejoice to the extent that, you're par- that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. He said, you will participate with Christ's sufferings. And that's not all that He said. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Can I tell you something this morning? You think we live in this perfect society? Let me tell you. Some of y'all, you have no idea what goes on behind closed doors, even in this church. This church, we ain't nothing. We're just a little hillbilly church in Lily, Kentucky. But let me tell you something. You have no idea how many times your pastor has received a death threat 
How many people have wrote us notes and left notes on our cars and tell us we're going to get something? How many times we've had to put our security team on high alert? Even this morning, we had a distraction before any of you ever get here. Why? Because the devil is mad and the devil is upset. You say, wait a minute, preacher. I went to my little church when I was growing up and nothing ever like ever, ever, ever happened like that. We never went through it. That's because most of you went to some little dried up church that the devil had you right where he wanted you. But the Bible said that even the demons will flee at the name of Jesus. And the devil hates you. He hates this church. And he hates what we stand for. And persecution is coming. You think about it. You can't say that marriage is between a man and a woman anymore. You can't say that God made you a boy or he made you a girl and you can't mix that up and change that. If you do, you're a bigot. If you do, you're a racist. If you do, you're not loving people the way that you you should. Let me tell you something, honey. You can throw me in jail if you want to. You can talk about me. You can criticize me. But I stand on the Word of God that marriage is between one man and one woman, and we are fearfully and created in God's image. Young people, He made you just the way you are. Before you were in your mama's belly, He knew you and He ordained you. Amen. Amen. You say, I'm not perfect, but I thank God for who I am. I may not be perfect, but I thank God for what He's done for me and who He is in my life. Now you wait, I'll receive hate messages for standing on the truth. But you got to get to the point you don't care anymore. Hey Amen? We've seen the denomination that Pentecost broke out to on Azuzu Street in the 1900s came to a certain denomination that I will not mention by name. Because it's not my place to tear down a denomination. But they made a decision that they would ordain homosexuals as ministers in their church. And it has split their denomination. Over 10 million people in the United States no longer have churches to go to. They've walked to. Even in our city right now, the church that I went to, that I was going to when I met my wife and we were married, had to disassociate themselves from this denomination because they won't stand upon the foundation and the fundamental God that we live and we serve and we trust in our life. Why? Because the world hates us and he wants to water down. The devil, you see what? If he can get you confused on whether you're even a man or a woman, what else can he confuse you of in your life? Amen? Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Yes. And all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You see, you have to understand. Some says, why does God allow persecution? Because persecution causes the gospel to be spread. Persecution will get us out of our comfort zone. (laughs) Look at Philippians chapter 1 verse 12. But I want you to know, brother, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. This was Paul writing to the church of Philippi. He said, brother, I may be in shackles right now. I may have shackles around my leg. I may be in prison. I may have stripes upon my back. But what I've went through and the persecution that I've went to has furthered the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because when you have been delivered from what some of you have been delivered from in your life, it doesn't matter what comes against you. You will not keep your mouth shut. You will not set. You will stand in the presence of your enemy and declare the goodness of God. Amen. Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. 
And he didn't write two-thirds of the New Testament on top of a hill somewhere. He didn't write two-thirds of the New Testament listening to birds sing and talking about how pretty everybody was. He didn't write it with his belly full, with new garments on, driving a Cadillac, but he wrote it in the pits of hell in his life, and we wouldn't even have the Bible if someone had not been persecuted. You ever think about that? Romans chapter 8, verse number 35 says it like this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? And the next verse, you all know that nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing can separate you from how much God loves you and what he's done for you in your life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, Paul said, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, he is strong. When I am weak, he is strong. Persecution builds loyalty. You remember the book of Acts we went over, how a Christian should act? Every time they would gather together and start preaching the gospel of Jesus, they would come in beating on them and stoning them, and they would spread, and it would cause this one to go into this village and this one to go into that village and this one to go into that city and that town. And the word of God spread not through wonderful, beautiful stained glass windows, but through people that had people that they loved that died for the cause of Christ. And here's what some of you say. What are you saying, preacher? Are you saying that, that, that we ought to be willing to die for Christ? Are you saying that God wants us to die for Him? No, honey. He wants you to live for Him. <laughs> you got it just the opposite. You're worried about dying. He's trying to get you to live. For I am crucified with Christ, but yet I live. Not I, but Christ that lives within me. And bless His holy name. Galatians 2 and 20. He don't want you to die for Him. He just wants you to live for Him. You think about the data. I'm going to give you a little bit of data here. According to David Barnett, puts the number of Christians martyred since the time of Jesus. I you to think about this just for a minute. The number of Christians martyred, not murdered. Murdered is just people that get killed. Martyred means you die for the sake of Christ. Seventy million people have lost their life that you can set where you're setting today and you can feel what you're feeling today. And you can raise your hands and you can worship God in peace and not worrying about somebody coming in those doors and arresting you for how you believe. We set, there's some of you don't even know where your Bible is this morning. There's some of you, your Bible's sitting on your coffee table and it's got two inches of dust on it because it's never been touched. But you can go over to China today. And you can go into the underground church that's there, even in Ukraine and even in Russia and even in North Korea. And you can go on and you can see the people in North Korea that's being being persecuted for the cause of Christ. They don't have a beautiful Bible with leather back. They don't have the red leather edition. What they do is they simply get together and when they can, they sneak into houses and basements with, with, with uh, candles and light the candles. And they have to take the Bible and rip the pages and take a piece or two of the Bible and they hide it on their body where nobody could see it and they sit under that candle and they read whatever page they have and they memorize it and give it everything that they have and they find out the communists come and find out their house they take that entire family and they'll put them in prison right now there are 1.2 million Christians in jail somewhere around this world for the gospel of Jesus Christ 
And he's given you 66 books, 39 in the old, 27 in the new. And there's some of you that take it for granted and you think you've been persecuted. But what would happen if all you had was two pages? Would you guide it with your heart? Would you guide it with everything that you have? Every day, according to 2021, is the best statistics that we have. There's more than 16 believers killed for following Christ. That's 6,000 martyrs in 2021. A 24% increase in Christians killed by their faith. Since what happened on the Gaza Strait happened, and we've had the persecution of Israel against the Palestines, on every university in the United States of America, not in Africa, not overseas, but God's chosen people, the Israelites, are being beaten and being raped, not for anything else, but because they're God's chosen people. You can flip a coin half the time whether you're even going to show up to the house of God or not. We don't know persecution. We don't know what's going to happen. But Jesus said, hey, blessed are the persecuted, for they shall inherit the earth. Folks, you better not take this thing for granted. Those of us that's been around a long time, we've lost more than we own. We, you, when you're young, you think everything's always going to be rosy and everything's always going to be peachy. It's already changed. Church ain't what it used to be. People are on a time. People don't want to watch live anymore. Or more. They would rather watch it. And listen, if that's the only way you've got it, that's the only way you've got it. But people don't have time for revival. They don't have time for prayer. They don't have time for the Word of God. Every generation becomes less and less and less and less sold out except for this one because this one's on fire for God when our adults aren't. Let's give our young people a hand this morning. Jesus had his 12 that he loved. Remember when James and John came to him and said, can we sit over on your right hand with you, Jesus, when you get to your kingdom? We don't care if we have to. We'll sit on the left. And that's when Jesus said what he said. Until you've drank of my drink and been what I've been through, you don't comprehend who I am. And plus, it ain't for me to decide anyway. Here's Jesus crucified on the cross. And when the thunder and the lightning rolled and the veil of the temple was rent from the top to the bottom and the earthquake took place and God's Son, Jesus, had died and life without Him began. He's raised from the dead. He shows himself for a while. Then he ascends to heaven. And the disciples gather together in an upper room, 120 of them. And finally they get all in one accord. And there appears unto them clothing, clothing tongues of fire, and it sets upon them. And they speak in tongues as the Spirit gives utterance, and they go out. Not only are they speaking in tongues, they're speaking in other languages. And they're witnessing to people. And 3,000 are added to the church one day. 5,000 another day. And everything's going great and everything's going wonder. But then the words that Jesus spoke to them and said, You will be persecuted. So did these 12 disciples? We know what happened to Judas. Judas kills himself after he betrays him. These other 11? Do they go around the world and set up their own little kingdoms where people can worship them and love them and say, Hey, look at me. I was with Jesus. I walked with him. I was one of his disciples. Bow down at my feet. No. You want to know what happened to most of them? 
Let's talk about Simon Peter, who he said, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. Remember him? The one that denied him three times? The only one that was brave enough to get out of the boat and step on the water? What reward did he get? We know in the second century, Peter was crucified on a cross for preaching the resurrection. And at his request, he asked that the cross be flipped upside down because he wasn't worthy to die the same way as his Savior. And they crucified him upside down on the cross. Andrew, his brother, was martyred by crucifixion in the Greek city of Pathras around 60 A.D. Like his brother Peter, Andrew didn't consider himself worthy to die in the same manner as Jesus. And so they tied him to a cross which was hung in an X shape instead of a T and they ripped his body in part as they hung him as he died upside down on the cross. James, the son of Zebedee, we learn that as he preached the gospel to Asia and he went around, that the king came and he was killed with a sword and lost his head. John, the brother of James of Zebedee, was put in a barrel of oil and cooked and French fried. His eyes were poked out, but he would not die. And in the Colosseum, he is heard screaming to the top of his lungs to the thousands of people, Jesus is the only way, as they boil his body. But he did not die. And the entire Colosseum is converted to Christianity because they could not believe what they saw. They finally don't know what to do with John. They take him to an island named Patmos, which is an exile island, and they drop him off. When all his body has been boiled, his eyes are poked out, and he lays there on a beach until he dies. But before he does, he gives us the book of Revelation and over. because they were plucked out of his socket. He said, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. <laughs> Philip led one of the pro council's wives to the Lord and the pro council became angry in revenge and had him killed with a sword. Bartholomew According, and if you want to get a book, let me recommend it. It's called The Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's a great book. According to The Fox's Book of Martyrs, Bartholomew was cruelly beaten and with little life left in him was crucified on a cross. Thomas, the one that was like some of you, he didn't want to believe. And Jesus said, do you not see the nail scars in my hand? Finally, he believed and he went around the world doing well. And he went to India where he was stabbed with spears. At least 40 went into him at one time in A.D. 72. We read a lot from the book of Matthew, who was the tax collector. Matthew was taken in A.D. 60 and hung upside down and split his body in half with an axe. James, the son of Alphaeus, was preaching in Jerusalem. They began to get stones, stones the size of boulders, and they beat him upside the head and stoned him to death. And his last words laying in his puddle of blood is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
Thaddeus was hewed into the long saw that had a man on each end, hewed in half. Simon the Zealot was crucified. He was sawed in half. Wow. And Matthias, who became the twelfth disciple after Judas killed himself in Acts chapter 1, he began to preach and cannibals came around them and acted like they were receiving the gospel. And when he bowed his head to pray, They crushed his skull and cut his head off and left him for dead. Some of you, when you get a hangnail, you can't come to church. Some of you spent seven hours yesterday on Facebook, but you can't take 20 minutes to read two chapters out of the Bible. Some of you have said more cuss words to your spouse in the last month than you have words of prayer and encouragement over them. And you think you have it so bad. And we sit here today begging you to make things right, begging you to give your heart to God. Let me tell you something. This isn't for the weak. There's a price to be paid. And as long as there's breath in my body, I will declare the goodness of God. I will stand for the truth of God. And no matter what comes my way, greater is he that is within me than he that is within this world. Will you please stand with me all over the building? Please, no one moving around. I want to share one more story. In 1962, a family was called to a remote village in Africa. The husband, his wife, and their six children. They go to a remote village that had never heard the gospel of Jesus. They led two or three people to the Lord. And they took it back to the chief of their tribe. When the chief of their tribe understood that they were going to worship something other than him, he became angry. And he sent men and women to their hut. And they took their six children. And they took this man's wife. And they tied them to a stack of wood with brush underneath and torches of fire in their hand. And they said, Preacher, you either renounce this God that you speak of or we will set your children and your wife on fire. He said, I cannot depress the things that my God has done for me. As they began to light the fire and the brush began to come up and the screams of his children, the words of his wife were recorded as she said, Honey, I will finally see my maker face to face. Do not give up. Do not worry, for we are sheltered safe in the arms of God. He watched his family burn, and then they beheaded him right there. That wasn't in the Bible days, that was in our generation. Men, I want to challenge you this morning. Is the love of God prevalent enough in your life that if you were to lose everything that you have for the cause of Christ, 
Are you strong enough in your faith? Do you trust enough in your God that He would be faithful and just to take care of you? I don't know about you, but when I speak of these things, it causes conviction to rest upon me. I don't care how bad you think you have it. You got some of most of you, most of you, not all of you, most of you got somebody this morning. You got a spouse, you got a kid, you got a best friend that you could just reach over and you could take their hand and you know they're there with you. And you know they're walking through this journey with you. Hey, the best decision that you can ever make in your life is for eternity. Because we base everything in this life on our 70 years or 80 years or however many gives it. But in the scheme of eternity, forever and ever and ever and ever, life is but a vapor. It's just a puff of smoke that lasts for a while and then it vanishes away. And weeping endures for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And whatever that we feel on this earth, is temporary compared to eternity. And I've got people over there waiting for me that I can't wait to see and be with. Take the world. Give me Jesus. No more excuses. No more games. No more manipulation. But God is calling men and women, boys and girls, to say, God, I'm going to give you everything, even if it costs me everything. Hallelujah. Will you please bow your heads with me just for a moment? I'm just asking the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart today. What's God speaking to you right now? Go ahead. Just have your moment with God. Have your moment with God right now. Lord, we repent of our arrogance. We repent of our complacency. For God, every one of us in this room are thankful and we have more than we deserve because of the goodness of God in our life. And Lord, there's some folks in this room that need to get their priorities straight. They need to realize who you are and what you have for them. And Lord, as we come to this time of prayer, I pray that this altar will be filled with sincere and genuine people that will fall on their face before you, O God, and sell out 100%. And Lord, there'll be some men that'll bring their families. There'll be some ladies that will bring their husbands. There'll be some children that will want to come to the altar with their parents, all ready to make a decision to understand this world is evil, but this world is not my home. And eternity is where we must prepare. In Jesus' name. Amen. As they sing, that's it, come on. These altars are filled this morning. These altars are open. Come as you are. Come on, come on up. There's plenty of room. Who else needs to come this morning? Don't let the devil talk you out of it. 
Step out of your seat. That's it. No more running, son. No more running. No more running. With every breath that I am able. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Hallelujah. You have 